Hello everyone, how's it going? How are you having a good day? All right, I am having a good day. The sun is out. It's supposed to be nice the couple next couple of days. I'm loving it. So, yeah. Might get some flowers, plant some flowers in my garden. Do you remember where we left off. There are some exciting things happening and I left you hanging. I know, I can't believe I did that. It doesn't sound like me at all. Or does it? Page 356, do you remember? Seth found the artifact. We don't know which one it is though. We don't know what it does. Okay. <clears throat> A single object rested on the floor of the safe. A golden sphere, approximately a foot in diameter, so about the size of a basketball. Its polished surface interrupted by several dials and buttons. Seth could not imagine what the peculiar device did. He pulled the sphere from the safe, finding it somewhat heavier than it looked. The room had been cold when he entered, but the temperature was now dropping rapidly. How near was the shadow lady? Perhaps just outside the door. Seth dashed to a window and threw open the shutters. There was no roof outside this window, just a three-story drop to the yard. Desperate, he began pressing the sphere's buttons, and suddenly, he was not alone in the room. A tall man with a mustache appeared in front of him. He wore a white shirt with the sleeves rolled back, gray trousers with suspenders, and black boots. He was fairly young with a solid build. Seth instantly recognized the mustached man from his photographs. It was Patton Burgess. You must be the youngest safecracker I have ever seen, Patton said amiably. His expression changed. What is going on? The door to the room blew open. The shadowy apparition hovered at the threshold. Sweat beaded on Patton's brow and he stiffly tried to turn, his body jerking weakly. Seth took his hand and Patton swiveled to face the apparition. Hello, Ephira. The apparition recoiled. What has happened to you? Patton backed toward the window, keeping hold of Seth's hand. I suppose darkness always was a downward spiral. No roof, Seth warned quietly. Turning, Patton leaped onto the windowsill. Releasing Seth's hand, he jumped, not down, but up, twisting to catch hold of the eaves of the roof above. His legs scissored as he hoisted himself up. Then he reached a hand down. Come on, he said. Ephira glided into the room, face enraged, fabric unwinding, rippling towards Seth. Clutching the sphere in one arm and blindly trusting Patton, he climbed onto the windowsill, stretched out his free hand, and pushed off. Patton's hand closed tightly around his wrist and swung him onto the roof. We need to get out of here, Seth said. Who are you? Patton asked. The caretaker's grandson. Fablehaven is at the brink of destruction. Patton rushed along the roof, shingles groaning and splitting beneath his boots. Seth followed. Patton ran toward the corner of the roof near where a tall tree grew. Surely he wasn't going to jump. Without hesitation, Patton sailed off the roof, catching hold of a limb that sagged and broke. Releasing it, he caught hold of a lower limb. Hand over hand, Patton made his way toward the trunk. When he got there, he swung up, straddling the bow. Toss me the chronometer. You expect me to jump? Seth asked. When jumping is the sole option, you jump and try to make it work. Toss it. Seth threw the sphere to Patton, who deftly caught it in one hand. What branch should I aim for? Seth asked. Go left of where I went, Patton said. See it? I left the best branch for you. The branch was at least 10 feet from the roof and five or six feet lower. It would be easy to miss it. He pictured his hand slapping against the limb, failing to grasp it securely. Do not think, Patton ordered. Back up a few steps and take the leap. Looks worse than it is. Anyone could do it. Seth stared at the distant ground. To fall from this height was almost certain death. He backed up, the shingles creaking underfoot. Peering over his shoulder, Seth saw the apparition floating toward him along the roof. There was the extra incentive he needed. He took three steps and flung himself off the roof. 
As he fell, the branch rose to meet his outstretched hands. The impact was jarring, but he held on. The limb drooped and bobbed, but it did not break. Like Patton had done, Seth advanced hand over hand toward the trunk of the tree. Patton was already climbing down below him. Seth descended recklessly, concerned about the shadow lady above. There were no limbs for the last ten feet. He hung and dropped. Patton caught him. You have a way out of here? Patton asked. Hugo, Seth said, the golem. Lead on. They dashed across the yard. When Seth looked back, he could no longer see Ephira. Where'd she go? He asked. Ephira detests sunlight, Patton said. Coming out on the roof like that pained her. She never was very fast, and she looks more weighed down than ever. She knows she won't catch us, at least not by giving chase. Any notion what happened to her? You know the revenant in the grove in the valley between four hills, Seth asked. Patton shot him a surprised glance. Matter of fact, I do, he said. We think Kurosak got hold of the nail that gave the revenant his power. How did the revenant lose the nail? Patton asked. They reached the cart and clambered into the bed. Go, Hugo, Seth panted. Fast as you can, run to the pond. The cart began rattling over the unkempt road. Seth located the spare flash powder and shared some with Patton. Actually, I pulled the nail out, Seth said. You did? Patton looked astonished. How? Pair of pliers and some courage potion, Seth said. Patton regarded Seth with a broad grin. I think the two of us are going to get along just fine. Keep an eye out for dark creatures, Seth said. Somehow between Kurosak, the Shadow Lady, and the Nail, a plague has spread through Fablehaven, turning the light creatures dark. Dark fairies, dwarfs, satyrs, dryads, centaurs, brownies, you name it. If the darkness spreads to humans, they turn into shadow people. Patton smirked. Looks like I landed in hotter water than I planned on. Which reminds me, Seth said, how are you here? You're not even old. The chronometer is one of the artifacts. Patton said, it has power over, have you figured it out yet? Time. Nobody knows all it can do. I've learned a few tricks. I pressed a certain button on the chronometer, knowing that when the button was pressed again, I would leap forward to that point in time and remain there for three days. You must have pushed the button and called me here. No kidding, Seth said. I only hit the button as an additional precaution to protect the artifact. I figured if a thief ever got hold of it, the culprit would eventually push the button and then I could steal it back. I never dreamed I would land myself in a predicament like this. My grandpa Sorensen is a shadow, said Seth. So is my grandma, everyone but my sister Kendra. Why are we going to the pond? Patton asked. Dark brownies took over the house. The pond repels the dark creatures. Right, the shrine. Patton looked thoughtful. He spoke hesitantly. What about Lena? Has she passed yet? No, actually, she's a naiad again, said Seth. What? That's not possible, said Patton. Lots of impossible things have been happening lately, Seth said. It's a long story. Lena was the person who told us about the safe. We should probably get under the tent. Seth started pulling the tent up. Why? Patton asked. The dark creatures are everywhere, said Seth. When we came to the manor, none of us drank the milk. We hid under the tent and no dark creatures bothered us. Patton stroked his mustache. I don't have to drink milk to see the creatures here, he said. I just ate some walrus butter, so I can see them now, too. Hiding may not do as much good. After what happened at the manor, I wager we can expect a serious ambush, said Patton. We ought to avoid the paths. Have Hugo abandon the cart and carry us to the pond cross country. Seth considered the idea. That might work, he said. Of course it will, Patton winked. Hugo, stop, Seth ordered. The golem complied. We're leaving the cart here, and you're going to carry us as quickly as you can through the woods back to the pond. Try not to let any creatures see us. And grab that tent. We'll need it back at the refuge. The golem slung the tent over his shoulder, cradled Seth in one arm and Patton in the other, and then tromped off the road into the trees. Okay, I'll keep going just for a little bit longer. Just for you guys only because I like you so much. And I know you're just dying for me to keep going so that you can find out what happens next, right? Okay, chapter 19. Duel. Who's supposed to duel? Do you remember? Seth and a centaur? 
That sounds like an even fair fight, right? Hooves clomping over the whitewashed planks, Doran sprinted along the boardwalk after Rondus, a portly satyr with butterscotch fur and horns that curved away from each other. Puffing hard, Rondus cut through a gazebo and started down the stairs to the field. Only a few steps behind, Doran went airborne and slammed into the heavyset satyr. Together, they pitched violently forward into the grass, staining their skin green. Doran rose swiftly and started after a petite hamadryad with short, feathery hair. Rondus lunged at a small, thin satyr, wrapping his legs together in a savage embrace. The small satyr toppled with a yelp. Kendra sat on a wicker chair in a nearby gazebo, watching the game of tackle tag. Each new individual tackled became a tackler until the last participant was brought down. The last person tackled became the first tackler of the next round. The agile Hamadryad twirled away from Doran several times, but he stayed doggedly after her until he finally got a hand on her waist, scooped her into his arms, and set her on the grass. The satyrs tackled each other as if causing injuries were the point of the game, but they treated the Hamadryads more gently. The Hamadryads quietly returned the favor by allowing themselves to be caught. Having seen the Hamadryads in action earlier that day, Kendra knew that the satyrs would never have been able to lay a hand on them unless the nymphs only evaded them half-heartedly. Kendra most enjoyed watching the Hamadryads take down the satyrs. The nymphs never dove at them or wrapped them up. They knocked satyrs to the turf with perfectly timed shoves and nudges, or by tripping them. What the satyrs made look hard, the Hamadryads made look effortless. The frenetic game helped to distract Kendra from her worries. What if nobody returned from the excursion to the manor? What if her friends and family had all been transformed into shadows that she lacked the ability to see? How long would it be before she followed? Why not join in this round, Doran asked, calling up to the gazebo from the grass below. I'm not big on tackling, Kendra said. I prefer watching. It isn't as rough as it looks, Doran said. At least it wouldn't be for you. At that moment, Hugo loped through the gap in the hedge across the field, ramming dark satyrs aside, holding Seth high in one hand and a stranger in the other. Once inside the field, Hugo slowed. Well, pluck out my horns and call me a lamb, Doran murmured. Patton Burgess. Patton Burgess? Kendra asked. Come on, the satyr said, already running across the grass. Kendra vaulted the gazebo railing and took off after Doran. Where was the cart? Where were Grandma and Grandpa, Warren and Dale? How was it possible that Patton Burgess was with Hugo and Seth? The golem set Patton and Seth on the ground. Patton smoothed his suspenders and adjusted his sleeves. Patton Burgess, Doran exclaimed, back from the grave. Should have known you'd turn up again sooner or later. Glad to see you aren't mangy and snarling, Patton said with a smile. I was grieved to hear about Newell. And you must be Kendra. Kendra stopped in front of him, a little winded by her run. He looked familiar because of his photographs, but they did not quite do him justice. It's really you. I've read your journals. Then you have an advantage over me, Patton said. I look forward to getting acquainted. Kendra looked to Seth. What about the others? she asked. Shadows, Seth answered. Kendra hid her eyes in her hands. The last thing she wanted to do was burst into tears in front of Patton. The creature at the manor was the lady outside our window on Midsummer Eve, Seth continued. The shadow lady who helped Muriel and Bahumat, she's the source of the plague. There's no shame in sorrow, Kendra, Patton said. Kendra lifted her damp eyes. Where did you come from? Glancing at Doran, Patton hefted the golden sphere. The object at the manor let me travel here temporarily. Kendra nodded, realizing that he didn't want to elaborate about the artifact in front of the satyr. Approaching hoofbeats made all of them turn. Cloudwing cantered over to them, pounding to a stop in front of Seth. The centaur stared at Patton, then inclined his head slightly. Patton Burgess, how have you exceeded your lifespan? We all have our little secrets, Patton said. Cloudwing shifted his gaze to Seth. Broadhoof sends congratulations on your safe return. He wishes to remind you of your engagement on the morrow. I remember, Seth said. What engagement? Patton interjected. Seth must answer for his egregious insults, Cloudwing said. A duel? Patton exclaimed. A centaur against a child. This is low even for Broadhoof. I witnessed the exchange, Cloudwing said. Broadhoof provided the young human several opportunities for clemency. 
I insist upon having words with Broadhoof, Patton said. I'm sure he will oblige, Cloudwing answered. The centaur cantered away. He treated you politely, Seth marveled. He has good reason to do so, Patton replied. I recently gave the centaurs of Fablehaven their most prized possession. Well, recently for me, a long time ago for you. Tell me about this duel. Seth glanced at Kendra. When we left for the manor this morning, a bunch of the creatures here ran out past the hedge as a distraction, so Hugo could get away with us in the cart. We wanted the centaurs to lead the charge, so Kendra and I begged them. When they turned us down, I basically called them cowards. Patton winced. The only words a centaur hears are insults. Go on. They tried to get him to take it back, but he kept antagonizing them, Kendra said. Finally, I agreed to a duel if they would lead the charge, Seth said. And they led the charge? Patton asked. They did a good job, Kendra confirmed. Broadhoof and Cloudwing were galloping toward them. Patton whistled softly. You deliberately insulted Broadhoof. He challenged you. You agreed on conditions, and he met the conditions. Right, Seth said. Then Cloudwing has it right. You owe Broadhoof a fight, said Patton. The centaurs halted in front of Patton. Greetings, Patton Burgess, Broadhoof said, dipping his head. I understand you intend to seek satisfaction against a youngster, Patton said. His impudence was flagrant, Broadhoof replied. We covenanted to resolve the matter tomorrow at dawn. The boy filled in the particulars, Patton said. I can imagine how your reluctance to assist with their diversion would have appeared an act of cowardice to such youthful eyes. With respect, you have no cause to intervene here, Broadhoof said. I am asking you to pardon the boy, Patton said. He may have been mistaken about your motives, perceiving indifference as cowardice, but his intentions were laudable. I fail to see what shedding his blood will resolve. We helped with the charade as requested in tribute to his courageous intentions, Cloudwing replied. In so doing, we fulfilled our portion of the compact. The injuries to Broadhoof must not go unavenged. Injuries? Patton said to Broadhoof, is your self-worth so fragile? Was the humiliation public? I was present, Cloudwing said, as was his sister. We have a binding arrangement, Broadhoof declared with finality. Then I suppose we will require an arrangement of our own, Patton said. From where I stand, Broadhoof, your willingness to engage a child in a duel, whatever the provocation, is a sure mark of cowardice. So now a grown man is calling you a coward in front of your friend, a boy, a girl, and a satyr. Furthermore, I perceive your indifference as a greater fault than your cowardice and condemn your entire race as a tragic waste of potential. Patton folded his arms. Recant your words, Broadhoof, Broadhoof warned grimly. My quarrel is not with you. Quarrel. Wrong, said Patton. Your quarrel is with me, not tomorrow or the day after, but now. I personally assume whatever blame you assign to this boy, I support and restate every insult he uttered, and I offer the following terms. We duel. Now, if you kill me, the matter of the boy is settled. If I best you, the matter of the boy is settled. Either way, all debts end up paid, and you get the opportunity to resolve this with a man instead of through a senseless mockery. A mockery? Seth asked, sounding offended. Not now, Patton muttered out of the side of his mouth. Very well, Broadhoof said. Without forgetting the good you have done for my kind, I acknowledge your challenge, Patton Burgess. Slaying you will bring me no joy, but I will consider all debts to my honor paid. I requested the duel, Patton said. Choose your weapon. Broadhoof hesitated. He consulted briefly with Cloudwing. No weapons, he said. Patton nodded. Boundaries? Within the hedge, Broadhoof said, excluding the woodwork and the pond. Patton surveyed the area. You want room to run. I can live with that. I am sure you will forgive me if I fail to make use of all the space provided. We must clear the field, Cloudwing said. Patton looked at Doran. Get the dwarfs to move up onto the boardwalk and strike these tents. You got it, Patton, Doran ran off. When the field is clear, Cloudwing said, I will signal the commencement of combat. Broadhoof and Cloudwing cantered away. Can you take him? Seth asked. I've never tested myself against a centaur in mortal combat, Patton admitted, but 
I was unwilling to discover whether you would have survived. In this predicament, we have a single certitude. Mercy would not have come to your rescue. Centaurs have let important wars pass them by without lending a hand, but insult their honor, and they fight to the death. But if you die, you won't be able to return to your own time, Seth exclaimed. History will be changed. I am not aiming to lose, Patton said, and if I do, at this point in time, my life is over and done with. I don't feature how what happens now can change what already happened. Because if you don't return, what already happened will never happen, Seth cried. Patton shrugged. Maybe. Too late to back out now. Guess I better focus on winning. When jumping is the sole option, he said. You jump, Seth finished. Guess what, guys? That's where I'm going to stop for today. I'm so sorry, but I have some other stuff to do, and I have... I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, but I hope that you come back for the next time because you want to know what happens, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I hope you have a great day. I miss you, and I will see you next time, okay? Bye, guys.